um, we'll start with the library, Sanford Library Facilities Financing Authority meeting first. Um, we call the meeting to order. Uh, then we have a roll call, please. Jamie Goldstein. Here. Taylor Bateman. Here. Carlos Palacios. Here. And Chair Martin Bernal. Here. Thank you. Um, the second item is uh, whether there are any additional materials. I can't believe so, but are there any? I have none at this time. Okay. No additional materials. Thank you. Any additions and deletions to the agenda? I have none at this time. Okay. Next on the agenda is oral communication. This is a time for anybody in the public who wishes to speak to the board on items that are not on the agenda but related to uh, financing authority matters. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to the board on oral communications? Okay. Can I point out that there's no water in the building today and we're very much looking forward to having a new downtown library. <laughs> <laughs> there no water. Um, we had a major water main break and so we're down at the moment. So if oh, um, people need itself. to use the facilities, the city hall is open. That's right, the bathroom door is there. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. I guess that, that isn't on the agenda. All right, next item is item number five, which is the executive director report. I have no report at this time. All righty. Um, item six is project updates and comments by board members. Are there any project updates and comments by board members? This is on the library. I don't have any. Okay. All right. Um, can I just, I, I'd like to make one about um, Belton's having a community meeting next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Senior Center to, um, sorry, I'll speak more loudly. Uh, we're jackhammering today. Um, Felton's having a meeting, a community meeting to go through a project specifications with the community um, Tuesday night at the Senior Center at 7 p.m. And we're hoping for a large turnout. I guess the other thing you might want to mention is we're kicking off the uh, advisory committee for the for the main branch. Um, the city of Santa Cruz has selected an, a downtown library advisory committee and is in the process of negotiating with an architect um, to help us run a process to look at a plan for the downtown library. Um, there is also a meeting tonight at the Simpkins Swim Center to talk about sort of the development of that and one of the ideas going forward is a library annex in the Simpkins Swim Center. So that's all very exciting. And I, I just have to say, Jeannie, um, the Capitola project is um, far out in front. The friends are um, working diligently to raise some funds for that project. So a lot is happening. Mm -hmm. I guess I will note that we're working on uh, internal naming rights policy in Capitola, uh, which we hope to have done in the next couple months, and then we'll come back, I think, to this board for final certification. Great. Okay. Could you repeat the meeting tonight? What did you say? The Simpkins Sw Swim Center is having a meeting tonight at 6 p.m., and Felton is having one on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is the consent calendar. Um, are there any items that uh, members would like to pull from the, from the calendar? Um, um, consent. Second. Um, before we go, I'll just ask if there are anybody in the public who'd like to comment on any item on the consent calendar. This is on the LFFA meeting. Yeah. Okay. All right. There's a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, so that passes unanimously. Uh, we'll move on to item eight under general business, which is the special tax bonds for phase one funding of library facilities. So we're on page 10 of the packet. We have a rather dense packet today. I want to point out that Scott Ferguson from Jones Hall and Suzanne Harrell from our financial advisors are here to help us go through this. Um, in front of you, there are a series of documents that need approval. Um, we have a resolution, a preliminary official statement, the fiscal agent agreement, 
and the official notice of sale. We've also attached the consulting agreement and the agreement for legal services for your information. So what I need is for this board to adopt a resolution authorizing the issu issuance of the authorities 2017 special tax bonds in a principal amount not to exceed 24 million and approve certain documents herein and take other actions in connection. Does anyone have any questions or concerns? So in terms of the timing, will we actually, so when would be the availability of funds with this first issuance? By June 15th. June 15th of this year? Yes. Okay. And, and then a second question, I see the capital is penciled in at 7.5 million, not eight. Right, if you'll remember at, our, at the last time that um, I met uh, with the board, we had a cash flow where this year's tax, 2016-17, was going to be distributed and you were gonna get about half a million of Bingo. special tax revenue and then the rest from the bonds for the total eight. Got it. And so those funds have been or are being distributed and so that's how I get net out to the eight. No further questions? All right, um, are there any members of the public who might comment on this item? Any other questions from the members? I had a question, just um, how many issuances are we anticipating over the course of the life of these uh, financing? We originally um, projected three um, based on, on the discussion from your last meeting. It's now down to two. It will really just depend on the timing of the uh, progress that is made by next June for the second bond issue, whether the city of Santa Cruz is going to be in a position to, to issue the funding or get all the funding it needs, or if it wants to delay a portion for another year or so. So right now, too. Right. I also think um, the Aptos project timing is important in this, but we still have the authority to do three. Okay. Uh, I'm concerned a little bit about the interest rate environment. Uh, can you give us a little bit of uh, your predictions of how interest rates are going to look uh, a year from now. Because sure. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you what's happened. So, so um, after the election, interest rates um, spiked, and there was a lot of thought that the Federal Reserve was probably going to increase interest rates three times in this calendar year. Um, they did in March. Right after that, actually, interest rates are actually a little bit better today than they were in March. Um, so the timing has worked out really well for this first series. Um, kind of the thought now is depending on whether tax reform gets done, uh, the Federal Reserve may not do three, three hikes this year, maybe only two. And so I think a year from now, you know, we might be looking at half a percent higher interest than today. Uh, again, it really just depends on how the economy reacts to what's going on in Washington. Um, and. But as we know, the, the limit for uh, the members of the JPA is that you can't borrow more than you think you can spend in a certain period of time. And so that's kind of the limit at this moment. What is the time limit? Uh, three years. So you have whatever we borrow in, whatever you borrow in June of this year, you'll have three years to spend. Whatever gets borrowed in June of 2018, three years from that, the clock starts. So it's important to have the plan for spending before the bond There's an eight-year window, eight-year window for the whole thing. That, and so, that was the original plan. Yes. Suzanne, I'm not sure you said though. What is the interest rate today? Today we're expecting it to be less than four percent. Um, as an average, so you know, some of the early bonds will be one percent. Some of the longer bonds might be as much as you know, um, four percent. Um, it really just depends on. We're hoping to get a double A credit rating, uh, which again will further reduce the the interest rate. So. When we developed this spending plan, what was the anticipated interest rate that we projected that we? I were did have? use a five percent rate okay. overall. So you were pretty conservative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there are other reasons why I think moving as quickly as possible is is at the NHP side, interest rates, also construction costs, uh, 
uh, as well as just the deterioration of the facilities. Um, and I think also just to be responsive to the community that, you know, we passed the bond measure and they were getting this done, you know, relatively efficiently and quickly matters significantly. So to the extent that we can move quickly, the better. All right. So with that, uh, is there a motion to um, move approval? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, so that passes the next one. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that is the item eight. Now, item nine is just the schedule of upcoming meetings. Uh, <coughs> next meeting of the LFFA is uh, June 1st at 6 p.m. at the Boulder Creek Branch Library, which I think would also be the meeting of the library board, too. So. Yes. Just as a matter of question, do, do we have items that are going to be due for us to adopt on June 1st? We might want to do the year and closing actions. We probably need to just update the budget. Okay. 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 Because to the extent that we can avoid, I think, sort of the double meeting, it's sort of a little bit cumbersome, I'm sure, to produce the agenda and for the public to participate. It always feels a little bit awkward. but. If we do need the meeting, then we should hold. And we have canceled the July meeting, so there for both entities, yeah. right? Yes. That's another reason to, to spend the money quickly to get stuff happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any comments from the public on item nine? Okay. So then we're at adjournment. Thank you. Next. Uh, I'd like to call to order the meeting you. of the thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of the <coughs> City County Libraries Joint Powers Authority Board. Um, we have a roll call, please. Jamie Goldstein. Here. Taylor Baton. Here. Carlos Palacios. Here. And Martin Bernal. Here. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, presentations. We yeah, have no presentations, okay. but I would be remiss if I did not say, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> <laughs> Today is our big Star Wars celebration. Oh, that's right. That's right. It starts at 4 p.m. <laughs> we would love for you to come. If you know any Star Wars fan, we suggest you bring them. We're hoping for water. <laughs> Darth Vader will be here. Darth Vader will be here. As well as Stormtroopers, Mandalorian Raiders, and quite possibly Chewbacca. What time is that? Four and four. It's never boring at the library. <laughs> so it's uh, here in the. It's downtown. downtown. There's a series of places. If we don't have water, it will be across the street under campus. Okay. I'm taking over your courtyard. All right. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, additional materials? Oh, I. Um, we passed out another schedule of designated positions and their disclosure categories. We missed one, and so we wanted to make sure you had the most accurate and up-to-date version. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oral communications. This is a time for members of the public who'd like to talk to us about items that are not on the agenda but are within the scope of the library authority. Oh. Okay. Oh, hi. Um, Judy, <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I was wondering when the names of the downtown advisory committee will be um, made known to the public and um, when their first meeting will be. The press release went out this morning at 8 o'clock. Uh -huh. And we are doing a doodle poll actually to figure out the first meeting so we don't have a date. Right. Soon. Okay. And it will be public, very public. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Anyone else talk to? Okay. Thank you. All right. So we'll move on to the next item, which is item six report by library director. I submitted a report in writing. I have no additional. 
Any questions from board members? Uh, yes? No questions. <laughs> I thought we were somewhere else. He's really excited about Darth Vader still. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, that can play on the agenda. That's my agenda. All right, uh, any, any member of the public that would like to comment on item six? Okay, we'll move on. There's no action required on that. Uh, item seven is a report by friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. This is Vivian Rogers, our new executive director for the Friends of the Library. Good morning, everybody. I feel like I keep getting introduced. <laughs> I guess I must be very excited. <laughs> um, so uh, I think it's been the better weather and the longer daylight hours because all the friends have been celebrating this last month, and I have great news to tell you. It started with Scotts Valley Chapter. They held a party celebrating the staff of the library and their volunteers. They hosted a dinner for them, and they give all little gifts, <coughs> not, not expensive ones, like gift cards to Amazon or whatever, I'm not exactly sure all the ones. And that was followed by the Aptos chapter. They dedicated their Waterwise garden at the library. Um, I'm not sure if you know, they spent about a year planning and getting donations, and then they spent a lot of time out there every weekend creating it. So a couple of weeks ago, they dedicated it. It's gonna move forward now with the Boulder Creek chapter. They um, funded the Two Gentlemen of Verona at Boulder Creek, Saturday, May 13th. And that's uh, the UC group Shakespeare to Go. And they have an annual presentation up there. And finally, the Felton chapter is going to have a festival to celebrate the coming of the library. And that's Saturday, May 20th, and there's going to be an auction with garden figures. Um, I do have one request. We are trying to get board members onto the Friends, so if you have people who are interested and would like to advise on what Friends should be supporting at the library, I, please let me know. We're looking for about six more people to join the board on this. Okay. Thanks. <coughs> okay, thank you. All right. Let's move on to the next item, which is report by the Library Advisory Commission. Martha Dexter. Hello. Um, I'm Martha Dexter, I'm chairman of the Library Advisory Commission. And at our um, April, let's see, our April meeting, we had a pretty fun meeting. This was um, focused on STEAM educational programming in the library. STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. Uh, it was led by Laura Whaley, who just gave you the wonderful new board buttons. Uh, Laura is the regional manager for the Valleys um, area of the library, and she sort of led the, the discussion, but she introduced Steve Mead, who is a volunteer. She calls him an amazing volunteer, and he really is quite amazing. He leads the Robo Sumo um, activity, which he demonstrated for us. Now, you all know what sumo wrestling is, right? Well, this program, kids actually make robot sumo wrestlers, and, um, and they compete. And uh, so it's very exciting because Steve has a lot of energy and he's really built this program. He also is behind the Lego program and the Lego club at Garfield Park and he is a major uh, force behind today's May 4th uh, celebration of Star Wars. Uh, Jen Hooker was also there, librarian at Scotts Valley, to demonstrate the 3D printing activities that they have going on up there. So what this really led to in our discussions was a better understanding, I think, of some of the, um, what might be considered unconventional programming for libraries. Um, this is doing robo sumo wrestling. This may not seem like something uh, that libraries would be involved in, but as Susan and Laura explained to us, this is re really addresses one of the pathways in our uh, strategic plan, which is focused on learning. And uh, it really is part of science and math and engineering uh, learning activities. But it also led the commission to spend some good brainstorming time about what does this mean for the buildings that we're going to be 
building and creating in the 10 spaces that we have available here in Santa Cruz County? And how do we accommodate this kind of alternative programming? Um, and another one of the pathways in our strategic plan is transformative spaces. And this really does call us to think seriously about that. And the Library Commission, the citizens that are on that are each one involved in one, uh, one or more of the 10 activities that are going on. So I think it was a productive meeting. Uh, we're looking forward in our May meeting to learning more about the Friends activities and what we might be able to do to work with them. So I think that's pretty much it. Do you have any questions? I'm just really pleased that the Advisory Commission has sort of taken on the strategic plan. Um, I think it's a really good use of our time and helps the library focus and talk about how we're moving forward on each of these initiatives. And it's really great to have a group of advisors sort of think through what we're doing and what we're not doing. I think another thing that came through this discussion was um, the opportunity to use really skilled volunteers in the library. Um, it, it, I mean, we're so lucky to have this gentleman. It'd be great to have 20 of them. <coughs> right. uh, and we have a lot of amazing people in our community who could really help us. Yeah. So there's uh, a lot of exciting things to work on. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Okay, uh, next we have comments by board members. Amy? <laughs> <laughs> No comments? Okay. I, yeah, I, I guess my my only comment is, um, you know, we're challenging. We're, our budget's challenging in the Capitol Branch Library. Um, you know, I think we're we're looking at a project that's about thirty percent more expensive than we were originally anticipating, which means the city is is you know, looking heavily to our friends to try to fundraise uh, the funding gap um, or our general fund and potentially even having to take a general fund obligation on to, to do this. And I know that we're first out of the gate, but I think that with construction costs, I suspect that many of my, my peers here around the table will be faced with similar challenges. And so to the extent that we can within our budget, if we have excess fund balance, you know, look at ways to augment those library budgets, um, you know, on specific things that could benefit all the partners and help help close funding gaps in the future because I know that you know, like I said when I know we're further ahead so we have a firmer grasp on how big the problem is but I suspect that we're not alone it's so, making that pitch okay I agree I think we're all gonna have a higher participation cost okay thank you Jamie uh, next is the consent calendar um, are there any items that the board members would like to pull from that consent we're, we've just moved to quarterly reporting, and I apologize for the length of the consent calendar, but this is the result of quarterly reporting. I have a question. I thought that maybe some of the quarterly reports were going to pivot down to discussion items. Is I would pull them then. Okay. I, I, I don't have a specific one. I know we went to this format. We thought, well, look, let's make more of a thing around each one of them. and. Um, You're right, we did. Yeah. So um, I, don't, I don't have any specific elements or questions on any of them at this time, but I do think that as practice, at your discretion, I think, bringing them forward and highlighting the contents, because I think it is important to take the moment to, to look at some of this information, because there's a lot of good information here. I will do so. Okay. Um, is there any member of the public that would like to discuss an item that's on the consent calendar? Uh, oh yes, you wanted to talk about the work plan, item H, uh, as I recall. I, I uh, have to go there. Well, you can sit there, it's okay. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't have the document for me, but um, I'm just, I know a lot of grades have traditionally done outreach, you know, to other populations. Uh, jails is one of the um, places, but uh, uh, as far as, you know, it seems like they're devoting quite a lot of hours um, to the homeless, um, dealing with the homeless, and um, as a librarian, I don't know um, if librarians are particularly trained to be social workers, and if that's a priority. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay. All right, thank 
thank you for the comments. Um, all right. Um, I'll move to the back. I'll second that. Okay, so the motion will second. Uh, all those in favor of putting the consent calendar, please add. Aye. 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 So I pass this unanimously. Thank you. Next, we move to item 11, general business. The first item on the general business is the library code of conduct and the recommended actions to approve the conduct of the code of conduct policy. And we are on page 95 at this point. Um, we went through this in great detail last month. Um, both Jamie and Tina gave us a lot of uh, changes and edits. It has been processed thoroughly by um, the library staff. And so I recommend that the board approve the code of conduct um, policy. And uh, <coughs> we've attached the procedural documents for your information. Any questions for Susan on the policy? Well, I I would just uh, emphasize again the need to um, institutionalize the training of staff on these issues, and to also uh, provide um, support to staff in terms of um, besides the training, whatever counseling that needs to happen. I know it's a very stressful environment at times, and uh, but I also think that training does help, um, and that it is not. Uh, this, this issue is, uh, I think, particularly severe at our library in Santa Cruz, but it's not unknown, as you know, yeah. throughout the country. And it's not just librarians. In fact, our parks workers, mm -hmm. when I was in Watsonville, deal with it, and then we do it with it in the county. Our parks workers deal with, with this issue. Of course, our fire and police mm -hmm. uh, deal with it all the time. Uh, our administrative staff deal with this now that you know, they, they come. And so it's uh, important that the training be uh, consistent, institutionalized, it can't be just a one-off. We, we gave a training on how to deal with these issues, uh, but it has to be <coughs> ongoing every six months, every year, training um, about how best to try and deal with it, with this issue, and then whatever support we can give to staff as well, because I know it's, it's very stressful to those who are on the front lines dealing with these issues. So that's the only thing I would emphasize, because I think that the policy is, is well done, uh, but it needs that, that back and support uh, for staff be able to implement it. Thank you. I agree. The other thing I would highlight too is that there are efforts to also address the just you know trying to sort of help individuals who um, are uh, uh, potentially causing some of these issues. A lot of it is related to you know drug use or uh, mental illness and so um, I think the county actually is, is working really hard to uh, particularly focus on the downtown area and around the library and city hall with uh, additional outreach to see if we can get some of these folks uh, connected to programs and services and, and try to uh, better address the root cause as opposed to just pushing them along because that's largely what we end up doing is moving it from one area to the other which obviously doesn't solve the problem. Uh, so there are renewed efforts to and enhance efforts to try to improve that. Um, and so we'll see hopefully in the next week. And I think when you leave the building this morning, you'll see a combined effort to um, the, la the city, the county, and the library doing an outreach effort we do every Thursday morning mm -hmm. here. So you'll see it as you leave. Again, I just want to say that this is part of our two-pronged strategy. Um, one is to identify where we can help this situation from but a library perspective, and the other is creating expectations about our environment. And this piece really is the piece about creating those expectations about how people use our facilities so that um, we can create minimum standards and expectations for the public as well. Uh, one of the th things I would uh, wanted to comment as well is that uh, the this issue in general is is a high priority of uh, both the city council in Santa Cruz um, and the board of supervisors. And there is a homeless coordinator position in the county that was created um, that is trying to uh, lead a coordinated effort <coughs> to this uh, issue. One of the uh, I know Jamie was very involved in the development of the All In Plan, which is the, the strategic plan for homelessness. And I know there's a city council uh, committee that's been meeting on this issues that will be reporting uh, back shortly. 
Um, and region-wide, there's a number of issues. Um, I know South County um, in Watsonville, there's a working group that's formed on this issue. I know Salinas has a um, major issue going on as well. Uh, one of the priorities that I've noted in the past uh, that we need to focus on besides, there's a, well, there's a myriad of, of issues we need to address, but one of them is uh, reestablishing the day services program. And I know that uh, part of what's happened is the uh, closure of the Homeless Services Center Day Center program. Um, you know, there, where do you put the folks when you push them out? You know, there's nowhere for them to go per se, per se. And when you have a day services program, you have somewhere for them to go, uh, get showers, use the bathroom, and then you can have services also located there. I know um, that in Watsonville and South County, they're looking at that issue. I know Salinas is is also trying to establish a day services center with a year-round shelter. So there are moves, and that ultimately that's the, the the solution. We know that you know you can't really solve this issue with your with your policy. It helps, the training helps, but ultimately we have to get the root causes. And it it's a region-wide issue. Uh, we we deal with the region quite a bit. And if you look at what's going on in Monterey County and Salinas, we're actually ahead of them in many ways. Uh, but they're facing the same the same issues oh, yeah. and very 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 difficult. So anyway, I want folks to know that we are we are working on this and we're hopefully going to be in a position of getting uh, some progress after all of the planning and, and talking. We've been able to do uh, some planning to make some uh, inroads. I think with some exciting new projects that will be coming up in the new year. And I believe in the all-in approach. I um, believe that the library is here to help you succeed and I'm really excited because I actually feel there's some real momentum going right now and I think we're going to see some significant changes I think we're starting to see them already yeah Carl's mentioned the, the City Council uh, homelessness coordinating committee so their recommendations will be going to council May 9th uh, they'll be considered and many of the recommendations uh, will be along the lines of what you've uh, noted uh, one of the other things that we're looking at uh, implemented that I think also will, will, will help tremendously is uh, a program that's been in place in uh, San Jose, San Francisco, and Mountain View, and now in Sunnyvale. It's called the Downtown Streets Team, and it's really a program that uh, through, uh, by uh, having people come in and uh, homeless individuals, uh, giving them jobs, uh, they are able to uh, uh, then uh, through case management, uh, divert them into programs and services uh, to make them you know, uh, you know, get out of homelessness. Um, and it's been very successful, and it has the added benefit of, you know, now members of the public mostly see homeless individuals just hanging out and, and you know, causing problems, but this uh, provides for, uh, you know, them actually being out there, you know, cleaning. Like, in, like for example, in uh, Palo Alto, they they maintain parking garages, so we're looking at hiring them to do that. They they work as bathroom monitors, so we're looking at hiring them to do that. They clean uh, the illegal encampment sites, um, and they don't pay them money. They actually pay them with food vouchers or storage vouchers or whatever they need to sort of facilitate uh, where they need to go. So anyway, we're lo really looking forward to that program as well. Okay. Um, I did, I did have one other question is that I know I won't reiterate a lot of points everyone else has already made. I know that we were talking about um, some environmental design changes around this facility. Yeah, I, I see we, we authorized some security fencing as part of the consent calendar. What is there any work planned in front of the library? Um, we're in the process of removing some benches at the front of the library and re-landscaping some of the front. The difficulty really has been um, we get such a large collection of people, it's sort of difficult to enter the building at that. Yeah, no, I recognize the issue for sure. Okay. Um, we remove approval of policy. All right. Second. Oh, I think you did. Sorry, public comment. Well, yes. Any public comment on the, uh, on the code of conduct? Code of conduct policy, oh. yes. Yeah, I thought it was really good as a librarian I work in Watsonville and um, we have a similar, but it's not quite lengthily spelled out, so I think it's really good. Uh, I just hope that uh, staff, at the description of the staff, of you know, serves the notice to the you know, problem patron. Uh, I'd like, hopefully, they'll be supported, possibly by security, because otherwise, 
you know, they could rip up the notice or say they never got it or something like that. So uh, they had another person there to be a witness, protect the staff. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll make approval. Approval for a second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, so that passes the announcement. Thank you. Uh, we're on to the next item, which is the library gift policy. So we bring you a, pol a draft policy one month, and then our hope is to approve it this, the second month. I'm not sure if we will succeed. Um, in the last several months, we've done the naming policy. And I think these policies are raising some interesting jurisdictional questions. Um, when does the library report um, to the JPA? And on what issues do they report to the separate jurisdictions? And this is coming up as sort of a constant discussion as we look at policies and procedures. So what we've been trying to do is say, we generally report to the JPA on everything but buildings, okay? Major changes to buildings. So the reason that the naming policy became so jurisdictionally focused is because building naming has everything to do with the jurisdictions. What we have tried in the gift policy, though, is to take it as more of a JPA policy and look at it centrally. The big issue around um, gift policies are um, well, I just want to go through a couple things that we're trying to achieve. Um, the first thing I want you to know is that gifts don't always come as money. They can be a piece of art. They can be a piece of equipment. Um, we have a gentleman who wants to give us microscopes. Um, the second thing I want to say is it is really important that this board agree that gifts are meant to supplement, not supplant, public funding. The idea is that we get more. If you allow gifts to become, to supplant public funding, nobody wants to give you gifts. I mean, it just really becomes that basic. So I think we need to have a basic principle that says this is in addition to, so that a community can buy things that may not come in the standard package. Um, the third thing I wanted to point out um, is somebody has to make decisions about condi uh, approving or disapproving conditions to a gift. The way it's written, I have suggested that that person be me. It doesn't have to be me. It could be this board. Um, you would be surprised um, the extent to which people like to add conditions to a gift. I um, worked for the University of Minnesota and I was trying to redo their scholarship database and I still remember the scholarship for the non-smoking Norwegian men. <laughs> and um, <laughs> the more restrictive a gift, the more problematic it becomes. And I'm gonna say that there are changes that people don't anticipate. We have a large endowment for magazines and magazines are going away. We didn't envision that. The person who gave it to us didn't envision that. But um, it's to our benefit to try and have as few restrictions on a gift as possible. I think the two common restrictions that um, we need to, to honor are restrictions to a, a building. So there are gonna be community people who say, I want my gift to only go to Capitola. And then there's also going to be restrictions, usually for materials. And hopefully they're not going away. Um, but I think it's in our best interest to try and um, limit the amount of restrictions that people want to give us. I also think there are certain restrictions we cannot do. We cannot provide special access. So I've encountered this where um, the Lions group wants to name, want to give $30,000 for the meeting room, and um, but then they want to be able to use it every Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. 
and as a public building, we really cannot have gifts result in special access. This is a little controversial in that gifts come both to the library and to the friends of the library. And uh, I really believe it is in the best interest if we try to direct all of our gifts to the friends of the library. You will always get a donor who says, no, I'm going to give it to the, the governmental jurisdiction. But I think we need to try and say, when someone says, here's $100 for Capitola, we need to say, make the check out to the friends of the library. The reason being is the friends have to create an accounting structure, a record keeping structure, a recognition structure, a legal structure, and a communication structure. The library's not very good at that, and if we can polish this all up, get the friends working as a smooth machine, um, they should be able to do all of that. They should be able to do it all well, and if we focus all the resources through that um, venue, which is a 501c3, um, I think that the whole gift giving and gift receiving um, will improve. I think the other thing, though, um, people have to realize is sometimes, especially an endowment, um, an endowment has to be tracked into perpetuity. There is record keeping that needs to happen forever so that if the donor's children comes and says, what's going with on with X, you need to be able to look in that file and say, these are the things that have happened and why. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, one of the problems we've had, because we haven't done this kind of record keeping, is we have a lot of gifts that are things that then become um, difficult to, in the library world, deaccession. Meaning, if someone gives you a quilt for a wall, it's 30 years later, the quilt is, is faded, how do you take that quilt down off the wall? And so a part of what we need to do in this process, especially around art, is um, have a, a whole series of policies and procedures that allow us to deaccession. So in addition to the policy, we have also given you um, the beginning of a procedure. What I would like to do is have a written contract um, going to the friends signed off by me. So I'm sign, say, signing, saying yes, we'll take it. The friends are um, signing and say yes, it's consistent with what we want. Um, but those contracts then also act as the, um, the written acknowledgement of any requirements of the gift. The easiest gift is money. And honestly, a donor can just send a note saying, here's $50,000 for the collection. <laughs> we probably won't make them sign a contract. <laughs> but if someone is giving us um, $50,000 for scientific equipment to support STEAM programming at Scott's Valley, we need to have that in writing so that we know what the expectations of that gift are. Now, I would say in my past, um, we did have a dollar figure where gifts are um, brought to the board, and I have not written that in, but that is something you may want to consider, gifts of over X. Right now, the naming piece is going to the jurisdictions for their approval, because we're, we're viewing that as a permanent change to the building. And. Um, my suggestion, we can talk about this, but um, I'd also be happy for to have individual conversations with you over the next month, and um, we've brought it to the friends. Um, there's plenty of controversy in all of this. Um, one of the things we're trying to do with the friends is understand sort of the legal entity. Um, the central friends group is the 501c3, the branch friends use their 501c3 number. We're developing an MOU, I'm working with Tony Condotti, about what does it mean to be the friends in terms of the library. And my hope ultimately is that we create the same kind of MOU between the branch friends and um, the, the central friends as well.
but what I'm trying to do is align expectations about who, how, where, when. Jamie, you've actually done a lot of thinking about this. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. You know, we struggle. I know at the Capitola branch, we struggle with the, um, help me, what was it called? The Friends of the Children of the World sculpture? Is this great? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> it was a donation. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And it was not quite as big as all these tables combined, but close. But almost. Almost. And it, it took up, you know, a huge amount of floor space in the Capitola branch. and. Yes. It became a big thing. Yes. <laughs> Literally. Literally, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, so, so I, think, I think it's really key that you're strategic about what you accept and what you don't. Um, the relationship between the friends and the, the branch is important. I'm a little, a little puzzled in the, in the policy, kind of the way there's some policy requirements that seem to point back to the friends, which feels a little funny in our policy. It seems like it's sort of more there's, but then at the same time, I also understand the sort of the relationship between the friends and the library does is necessarily intertwined. So, um, but I think the key is to be able to say, to be able to have a have a body that can effectively, or an individual that can effectively say no um, when the conditions aren't acceptable or the piece isn't relevant. Mm -hmm. So, if this is what we need to get us there, I'm all for it. Um, and I would just say there is a bad guy in this, uh, often around art. And um, this is why I suggested be me, and that if you look procedurally, what I'm trying to do is have a committee, an arts committee that includes both friends and staff, um, so that it's not totally me, but. Um, I for sure don't want to get elected officials involved in that because I think that's really difficult. Mm -hmm. And the question is, do you want to be involved in those decisions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was visible in the back of the room. <laughs> I, I would say one of the things, I guess, depends if we're talking about a certain dollar amount. I mean, and I think that's an important consideration. If it's a million dollar gift, you know, in, a, in yeah. an object or something, I think there would be a need for some review of this body. And so what, something to consider at least. What dollar amount triggers? I don't know. I mean, that's, you know, I think mean, that's something for us to consider over the development of this policy. But. I have a couple of comments. Uh, one, with regard to endowments, um, I would suggest that you talk to the Santa Cruz Community Foundation. And we and, already have. And so that would be a good, a lot of agencies don't, it's so, so legally complicated that, you know, to try and have yourself or the friends deal with it is not realistic. But you could do a contract with the Community Foundation. They do them all the time. They do them for other nonprofits and so forth. And they have a, the legal and financial counsel to know how to do those things. So that, and you get the money back. They just charge us a fee for administration or whatever. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing about the uh, decision making, I, I think these are going to be controversial. And I don't, I've had a lot of experience with this over the years. I remember we had a, um, a gift of uh, a painting of, regarding the El Salvador Civil War. And there was a uh, American flag and so forth. And so uh, there was a lot of controversy on it. And the library, the person way back, this is going back years, said, no, no, it's too controversial. So even when you don't, then there was a big protest about you rejecting it. Uh -huh. And I don't, I think I'm, um, I'm willing to let you try to do this, but I don't think you will be able to ultimately. It, it bumps up politically. I mean, because right. ultimately it's a political decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can try You're and right. say, I'm not going to do it. You know, say no, I, I say no to this art. And then they're going to go to their council member, they're going to go to the board member and say, how dare her restrict my freedom to express myself or whatever. And, and then you're now in the hot seat. So I don't know if there should be, and then we have a, the added complication that you have the jurisdictional, so you have the Capitola Library or the Aptos Library and you have a work of art, you're making a decision, then, but it's the Capitola's library and his council, or it's our, our board of supervisors, and, and they're saying, well, why is she making a decision about this art over our library? And, and so, so, Carlos, which raises a really good question for me that I'm struggling with right now. Um, 
do the jurisdictions own the building or do the jurisdictions own the objects in the building? Right. And do I make the decisions about the objects in the building or does the jurisdiction make the decision about the objects in the building? And, and again, this is also, I know that when I say, do I make the decision, I'm actually talking about the JPA. I'm not talking about me. But it's, this is one of these pieces where I don't know when I report to the jurisdiction and I don't know when I report to the JPA. Well, that, that is um, one of the issues we need to work out with regard to good lease agreements between the JPA and the jurisdictions. I think that that's going to be spelled out. Um, I know that you are having an art committee uh, or you're having a committee. So I think that, that might be the key, is trying to figure out who's on that committee. Mm -hmm. That's the way that we ultimately dealt with it. The council got in the middle of this a number of different times on various issues over the years. Um, and ultimately, the way they dealt with it is they formed an art committee that they kind of made the decision. And then they just said, well, they let the chips fall where they may. And it had uh, representatives from the art community and and it had some, you know, that it was appointed by the elected officials so that they, you got separation because then if you're appointing, you know, or we're appointing, then they're saying, well, why don't you appoint that person? So the way that we did it is the council, it was an art committee that the council actually appointed. <coughs> and then they let the decision be what, what they made because there's, there we had a controversy over um, the uh, Agricultural History Museum where there was a big donation to the Watsonville Library to establish this Agricultural History Museum, and the, and there and there was um, a big controversy between the growers and the farm worker advocates, the UFW. What's going to be presented in this, and who's giving it, and and so forth. And again, ultimately, you know, administrators can try and weigh in on this stuff, but ultimately, it bumps up politically. You're right. You know, so right. I don't know if you want to. We should think Pretend. of how <laughs> to have some kind of appeal process because I think. On 90% of the stuff, you will be able to make the decision, and it'll be fine. But there's 10% that if we don't build an, an escape valve, uh, I have to have something. You have to have something of. Uh, I don't know if there's an appeal process or we need to think about that piece. I think that's the only part I'm unsure of because I think I like the fact that you're willing to make these decisions, but I don't think that's realistic in the end because. The, Whoever doesn't win in, at that point mm -hmm. is just going to go straight to the Capitol. If it's in the Capitol Library, they will go to the they will go to Jamie. They'll go to his council. His council will agendize it, and then it's going to be there. And then now, now we're in an ad hoc situation where we're trying to make it up as we go along. So that's I would just think about that one piece a little bit more about how do we have an escape valve when it does become because these things, as you know, you've dealt with it, and and Jamie just mentioned one becoming incredibly uh, political. And it only happens once every 10 years or so, but, but when it does, it's uh, pretty ugly and it gets everybody stirred up. And so I, it would, if we could think of some way to have an appeal process or some escape valve for you and for the library, because it's going to happen anyway, uh, that would be good. And my gut is to make that escape valve this, this body, not the individual jurisdiction. But that it has a policy implication. Yeah. So, um, so, well, so, so I, I echo all the sentiments I have. I've only had this happen to me once where we had this sort of controversial, weird art thing, and it was it, it was bizarre, and it was very difficult to handle. And I clearly was didn't feel like I was you know the person who was best equipped to to make a final resolution of it. I I, I do I differ a little bit though. I think with Carlos in that. The relationship between the JPA and the jurisdictions is a little different than it was in Watsonville. In Watsonville, it was your library, it was very clearly your library, and so obviously the ultimate decision maker on what was going to go on in the premise was the city council. You know, we each have leases back to the JPA, which pretty clearly say that it's your building. Unless I'm mistaken, I mean, I, I, I don't know. So I have this um, next on the agenda. Okay, great. Um, right. Well, I think there's also a difference well, between the building itself and then what, like, you, like you, as you differentiated the, the stuff that's in it. Uh, you know, and and the, the, even there, I mean, I think even with normal leases, obviously, you know, leases tend to sort of deal with it. I have building. two leases and two not leases. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. If so, and I don't know if there's consistency. Uh, yeah, there there may not be, but I'm looking at so from the capital's lease perspective, it's it's the inside is theirs. Um, 
And then in the agreement we have with the county about constructing a new library, it says pretty clearly the lease shall require and designate library assume all responsibility for the maintenance, repairs, operations of the library and the premises. So in some senses, I get it. I hate to see it sort of bumped here. In some ways, if it got bumped here, what would end up happening, I think, is, is if we had a controversy in Capitola, I would take it to my council for advice about how I would vote, but then I would be subject to you guys potentially overruling me. So it, it, it well, Wait, I, 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 I don't know if I have the right answer. <laughs> well, I, if, it, I, if it came, if it did come to us, I wouldn't vote on that. I would, I would form a you committee defer or defer to. I'd form, the, I'd form yeah. either the advisory. Maybe that's the right place, the advisory commission, because or or an art. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I'm trying to figure out. And again, I don't think right. we have to resolve this today. Yeah. But as we began to try to create policies for this new GP, JPA. What, what it's pointing out is we don't yet have a complete philosophical framework for thinking about where the library fits vis-a-vis -vis the jurisdictions and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, right. the, the whole. Right. And, and there's some good models out there. I mean, my comments were going to be a lot, mostly focused on the, on the public art stuff because that's where I've had public experience as well. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like suggest, everyone's had this. I was going to suggest if maybe if you wear the Darth Vader uh, outfit. <laughs> But, you know, uh, we have the city, we have, uh, and the other item that's actually been really controversial is the, the deaccession and how that happens, because there's actually federal laws that relate to that, so you have to be really, really careful. You can get in a lot of trouble, and we've had experiences with that, where then you, you, you've got liability to the artist, depending on what you do, you got to notice, if you got to take it down, it's a whole process for that. Um, what I would recommend to you is maybe to talk to, we have a public arts coordinator uh, position we have a public arts committee or commission uh, who is in the last few years in particular have really updated policies and procedures on public art we have all over all over the city all over downtown and artists that you know donate things so I think they've got a, a lot of really really good information having a committee there has actually worked really well and it has artists on it so it has credibility and so I think having good policies you know sound policies and having you know some some valve like that, some committee that has you know also credible individuals on it could be helpful. That's what seems to have worked to be able to uh, address some of these uh, public art pieces. Because I've seen many you know over the years where, for a variety of reasons, on Westcliff Drive because they're sort of worn and torn, uh, and they're they're looking at you know decommissioning it. There's a controversy around that. So. That's one resource that I think you might want to look at. And Amy Sherman's doing the legwork on this. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah, so Beth Toby over in. Beth Toby? Yeah, okay. she's in the Economic Development Department. Thank you, Martin. She's, she's the public art coordinator. Okay. I may not get this one back next month if I feel like we have more legwork to do. But I, again, I think this is raising really interesting questions for the board. Well, it'd also be interesting to hear from the friends, too, in, in terms of how they feel about the, the issues and get your input on it, too. Yeah, I think, I think they're working on it. Yeah, well, we talked a little bit about it, but now as I'm thinking about it, it would be great because we have such respected art groups in town to have them mm -hmm. more involved in that mm -hmm. as be as experts. <coughs> Yeah, and Beth is really connected to all of the different artists in the group. So there's some good resources in, 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 the, in all over the county, quite frankly. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, too, I mean, I think these once in a decade events are important to think about, too, but also just the kind of the daily stuff. You know, if there's a gift that is has a reoccurring expense, I don't know, if microscopes, if they need to be maintained, you know, we need to kind of maybe make sure our policy looks at those kind of expenses that you might be taking on. Or a so piece you're of saying art. articulate a, sort of a criteria yes. of Which how we evaluate a gift. Okay. Are there ongoing expenses? Does right. it need to be insured? We need right. durable things right. in the library. Yeah, right. Is it durable enough? Right. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think that's yeah. great. And those policies exist. Yeah. You don't have to start from scratch. And then whatever is ultimately set up, make sure you are sensitive to the local jurisdiction's unique needs. I think, you know, from each jurisdiction will have different kind of focuses there do have on to say what's important and what's not. So so many of the votes here are require unanimity. You know, I, we will be very. Yeah, but not on that one, I don't think. <laughs> well, like you said, <laughs> if, if, if the friends are going to be in charge of it, maybe you know, weighting it towards the local jurisdiction, however you structure it, I don't know, but it's something just to keep in mind. And you brought it up already. I think you're very aware of that. It's a good idea, though, weighting um, the membership. Towards the 
but if it's once in a decade, we won't remember the waiting when it comes up. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. So or even give, just being non controversial. Maybe decision. you give seats to people from that community where the art is supposed to go. One, one point I wanted to touch on that you asked the question about sort of a threshold for does a gift ever bump up to the board level here for approval and when we adopted the gift naming or gift, gifting policy in Capitola, the way we, um, it was several years ago, but my memory was that we said if it's for an ongoing program, you know, a city program, it's like it didn't matter how much it was. Like if somebody wanted to come in and say, write us a check for $100,000 for junior guards, like great, we would announce it at a council meeting. So it wanted to give us $100,000 to establish a new program for, you know, water safety or something, or, you know, forestry that we, we didn't do, then that was kind of the trigger to bring it before the board. So maybe that's, I'm not, mm -hmm. In some way to think about it, you're talking about that kind of threshold is what would be a staff level acceptance of a gift and is there, a, is there another trigger for when it comes to the board? And maybe it's if, it, look, if it's just money for books, you know, effectively your, your acceptance ability is unlimited. If it's money it's for- It's those conditions that, that's the hard part is the conditions aren't always straight financial. So for example, if someone gives me a painting that ha is worth a million dollars, and I accept it, the truth of the matter is there's an obligation potentially to keep it safe, which has a cost to it, to you know, insurance and security. So the hard part for me is often those conditions aren't a straight financial, it's a... It's a new program. Yeah. And I think that, that's, that that does trigger, under, under our model, that would be kind of the trigger for the program conditions you know yeah I mean if you already have a program to display pieces of art and you know five right. pieces of really valuable art and someone comes along and gives it a sixth it's like hey it fits in the program we already have a program to accept and deal with art like this but if it's like new different and you have language around that I'm speaking so confidently. <laughs> I mean, this was something I think I did uh, three or four years ago, and I, I think I might. <laughs> <laughs> that was very Can you look at that for that too? I, I agree because I think it's a more subtle distinction than fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah, I think having thresholds of some sort, you know, makes sense uh, in terms of monetary as well as, again, whether it's ongoing or one time kind of. And you, yep. and you should have your discretion too. I mean, because we can't build in every possibility. Right. right. But if she knows that, if know, I have concerns about it, yeah, if you have concerns. Right. And the library advisory commission might have a role too. I mean, the other the other place that I would look to, is the <coughs> parks department has a gift policy as well because they receive a lot of gifts, you know, to the community center, the civic auditorium, just a whole variety of cultural facilities around the city, and they take things to the parks commission depending on criteria. So that would be another policy that you have to look at. So there's some around. At least the city that you can look at. So. Thank you. Model. All right. Are there any uh, comments from the members of the public on this? Yes. I, I do that for the friends. I have a couple that I brought up earlier. So, what am I really, as a friend, talking to donors? I definitely need the a streamlined hierarchy because if, especially for naming, there's a possibility that we would dename a building for whatever reason. And so they originally see that they're dealing with this contract with Susan and, and friends, but then they hear there's another organization that can take their name off. So they just having the hierarchy or some sort of pathway. And then in terms of uh, Jamie's comment, if someone gave us $100,000 immediately for a new program, I would say, yeah, let's have the library do it if possible, if it's cash up front and it's just one or two years. It becomes a problem when it becomes a permanent restricted gift and we're just doing the interest. And that's when the conditions come out. So even if someone said, I gave you a million for books forever, that may be scary because like magazines, we don't know if books are going to be around in 100 years. Okay. Um, we have no decision to make on this. It really was for discussion. Okay. All right. I'm sure no other public comments. Okay. So we can move on. The next item then. Um, the old JPA and most library boards across the country endorse basic ALA guiding statements. Um, my suggestion is that we not modify it. 
Um, if you look at the freedom to read statement, while incredibly compelling right now, it was actually primarily created in 1953. If you look at the freedom to view, that goes back to 79 with modifications. And it really just sets the principles by which, the philosophical principles by which a library operates. And then um, the Library Bill of Rights is a very common thing for boards to endorse. We do um, have these currently in the, the JPA policies. They have been updated since we approved them. We would like to re-approve them, and to be honest, without it. So that next no, I month, ask <laughs> just because I have to. Um, okay. We'll bring them next month, though, so you have the opportunity to contemplate. Is there a legal requirement to have these, or is no. this just a okay? It's custom. Okay. Um, it does make philosophical statements, like libraries will make meeting rooms available on an equitable basis, which, which has legal ramifications. but it's sort of foundational for us to do so. Um, and then the last thing from a policy perspective was the library capital expenditure discussion, which we had last month, and many of you were not here. Wait, wait, you're moving on to the next I item? Am, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed. I have to have, no, okay. and also we have to have public comment. On that. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody want to comment on the, this item, which is the AO American Library Association guiding statements? Okay, and there's no action, it's just report act. We'll approve next month. Okay, thank you. Okay, we can move on to the next item then. So we talked about the library capital expenditures, um, and this is where I'm getting to the lease. I actually have two leases, one of which um, has expired, so I only have one lease. Um, and they are remarkably different. <laughs> And um, I believe that we are not treating all four, four jurisdictions the same in terms of who's paying for what and we need to get there. So basically, uh, with, that's correct. We just have Capitola, right? Because Scotts Valley expired. Scotts Valley expired? Um, but Scott's Valley has a lot of things in it that make me really uncomfortable, I'll be honest, and I can show you all of that if you'd like. Um, I'm happy that it's expired. Um, I think, though, one of the first things we need to do is um, create a lease between the library JPA and the jurisdiction that defines that relationship. Um, be, and I think this is a fundamental issue for how the library operates. I don't think this will necessarily be an easy thing to do. But um, Martine, when I heard there were leases, there is a La Selva Beach lease, I need to say, mm -hmm. between the county and La Selva Beach, yeah. which is sort of a separate Right, um, and there might be issue. issues between the building when it's a rented building. And Correct. But I think, um, in order to treat you all fairly, we need to create a single lease that we sign with all four jurisdictions that all four jurisdictions are comfortable with. And then we decide the level of operating funds we need to have in the operating budget. And we need to consistently apply that across all four facilities. And then we need to discuss how we do capital improvements when we get beyond measure S. Um, and we are doing this pretty inconsistently across the board. Yeah, I would reiterate this. I do, you know, I've looked into this a little bit and it's not consistent. I don't think it's equitable across the board. And I think that that's probably goal number one is just coming up with a standard set of, you know, it's the, mm -hmm. you know, the library takes care of the site or the city takes care of the site, the library takes care of the interior. Just what those standards are, who pays the bills? I don't think even who pays the bills is consistent. No. Um, and we're all equal members at the table, and so I think that that's kind of some basic stuff that we should we should work through. 
I know that at the last meeting, my public works director was here, and I think he worked on a subcommittee to try to, but is, it, is this table the output? Um, oh, no, this, oh. this was the input, but I felt okay. uncomfortable after the last month to not have this conversation with the full board. The full board. Okay. Yeah, well, I think it's really important. I mean, I, you know, I, I, in terms of clarifying roles and responsibilities, in terms of equity among partners, in terms of the investment we're all making, it's really time to do this. Um, I know that in Scotts Valley's case and in Capitola's case, there's some nuance in that we have, at least in Capitola's case, we have an as yet unexecuted agreement to build a library. And that agreement has in place in it some sort of terms that say, these shall be adhered to. Now, presumably if the county and the city both agree that we will adopt at least a slightly different, there's a real problem with that. But that, that, that should be part of the discussion is understanding kind of the framework for what is set in place and then what is reasonable. Um, so, so I'm glad you're addressing this because this has been a bugaboo of ours for a while. And I also um, really need to understand the extent to which the library is a tenant or operationally responsible to the jurisdiction. And again, I, I'm not trying to say that I won't be sensitive to the jurisdiction no matter what. I have every sensitive, uh, every incentive in the world to do so, but I think we need to have a consistent expectation about the role of the jurisdictions and the operations of the library. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I agree. That we, it'd be good to, to clarify that, have consistent standards and address the various issues. So even the building uses vary. So. Steve and Tina had potentially um, been interested in doing this. Carlos, I mean, and I don't know if we can do a subcommittee if we have three. You yeah. see what I'm saying? But, um, well, if they're not us. Oh, not us? Yeah. If it's Steve and Tina and all right, yeah. but also Nicole tends to be really good at this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to say it until she leaves the room. <laughs> the problem is Nicole's good at everything. <laughs> I know. But um, I need help to even put it yeah. on paper. Uh, I think a subcommittee is a good idea because I mean, you're going to have a hard time getting us to focus on this, at least me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think Steve would be great in Capitola. He's well versed in our in our lease and understands how at least it works in Capitola, and so that provides that context. And we can provide somebody. I don't know who yet. Okay. But. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who yet either. So will you work on that? I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. We might as well have all four, and then I can bring the original leases as a starting point. Yeah, sounds great. Okay. Okay, great. All right, are there any uh, other comments or uh, comments from the members of the public on this item? All right, I think we'll move on. There's no action on this item. All right, moving on to the next item, which is the budget. It's the preliminary budget? Right, public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 17-18 budget for the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Susan? Um, we're trying to do a status quo budget because we made such significant changes to the budget months ago. Um, overall, our um, change to the budget is 5.27%. Um, a big chunk of that is the new staff the point or the 4.625 FTE that we have added to add hours. Um, the hours are going to be celebrated on June 3rd. Second. Second. Oh, you're right. I forgot. Um, June 2nd. Um, we are almost at full capacity in terms of staffing, which will be a first in a long time. Um, our sales tax revenue is projected to go up. Thank you, Marcus. We are expecting a $70,000 increase from the city of Santa Cruz as prescribed in uh, the second amendment to the LFA agreement. Um, we have a reduction in professional services as a result of um, some of the Measure S items being paid. Um, we went and did a detailed analysis of our technology shop. Um, we've dropped some of our maintenance on um, hardware, and that's saving us a lot of money. 
I'm trying to, though, increase our professional development budget uh, by $20,000 because we have a lot of tech training we need to do with staff in the next year. Um, we are trying to spend out some of our trusts and we um, discovered that one of our trusts that's going towards materials right now um, can be used for programming. So we're going to spend some of it on that. And then we're replacing a um, maintenance vehicle. So there aren't really large changes that we're proposing. There is a summary of the budget and a summary of the revenues. Jamie. So we are proposing to use $400,000 from reserves. But if you see at the bottom, that gives us $150,000, so it'll be two fifty. dollars Okay, and related to that is, is we're showing an operational surplus of two eighty three dollars in the current fiscal year? That's what we're showing, but we'll see. Do you think it's going to be that high? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> so that's the projected. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say operationally no, but with a one-time LFA uh, reimbursement, you, you may hit that target overall. That makes sense. So cash flow, you're going to be strong. Yes. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So our net changed our cash position with the one-time transfer in this fiscal year, maybe on the order of $120,000 not 400 like we said. The net change next year we're projecting maybe on the order of 250. Does that kind of jive, Marcus? Okay. So yeah, we have money to help out with the jurisdictions to fill the great libraries. <laughs> I'm trying really hard not to um, spend the reserve, or not the reserve, the unrestricted. Oh, yeah. we're not going to spend them. Oh, no, the fund balance. What this is also pointing out to me is that there is some recurring funds to pay for um, those added hours. We we kind of knew that. That's how we build up the surplus. On the right. well, yeah, but there, there, there will be a slowdown here. <laughs> so, yeah. so. Does this get us to our target on our materials? Eight percent. We think ten percent is considered a better eleven. So we're still not there. And the one thing yes, we're still not there. So I had, I had some questions. If I um, first of all the on the um, spreadsheet, the two thousand sixteen seventeen um, that's an estimated actual or that's the adopted budget? That's the, adopted. that's the adopted budget. So can I see, uh, have another column added that has the adopted budget and an estimated uh, actual for the current year and then the proposed budget? Yeah. Um, so that I can see what we're actually spending, uh, projecting to expend for each line item? We'll do. Do you think it's estimated actual? Well, they just said it's adopted. We didn't adopt a budget with a two hundred eighty-three thousand dollars surplus. Marcus, can yeah, we how does that work, Kira? Because yeah. we wouldn't have adopted a budget with a two hundred eighty-three thousand dollars surplus. Um, let me whack into my records. Okay. Well, if we could have both, just yeah. adopted, estimated, actual, and then proposed, um, that would be helpful. And then I um, would also like, um, if you, for the line items that have. Um, the more significant changes, most of them could interested in dollar amount changes. Could we just have um, notes to this, or I, what I have our staff done is a change chart where we actually have the adopted budget, the proposed budget, and when there's a significant change, we explain it. Just because there's some items that I just that are there's significant changes, somewhat in terms of dollars, and I just don't. I don't know what they are, and so just a short explanation of why it's going up ten thousand dollars in this line item, or why it's going up or down twenty. For example, training conference is going up twenty thousand dollars, and um, 
And so I have travels going down five thousand. That kind of. I have um, some of it, but okay. would you like it on the chart itself? Um, for me, it would be helpful on the chart, but okay. as long as because well, then I can just look across and you know you just have a little text box and I can just look across and see the change. That would, for me, that would be helpful. And then the other question I had is in terms of the. Um, the positions, do, is this agency exercise position control? In other words, do we adopt positions and you know, some jurisdictions don't, you know, they just give adopt appropriations and positions are, you know, are not adopted, the control seat is not adopted. Or have we been in the practice of adopting a position control yes. sheet? Okay. And I can give you that sheet. So then I'd like to see that too, just so I know what we're adopting in terms of positions and, and again, changes that are happening so that we can, so I can um, and, uh, track um, that. Last year versus this year is a little difficult in that we had so many um, changes to the organizational structure. So um, I can show you last year and I can show you this year, but it's hard to. And then if I could also see a uh, fund balance um, analysis. And the most recent one I have is included in the, um, the